Welcome to Cunningham Piano. I'm Hugh Sung. Uh, just kind of doing an impromptu live stream show. Uh, I've been posting a series of videos to help a lot of my colleagues get up to speed as quickly as possible to teach their music lessons online. We're in a pretty uh, unprecedented time where we, a lot of us have to learn some new technologies very, very quickly. So uh, I wanted to share some of my experience with music technology to help make the transition as smooth and as quick as possible. Uh, a quick background about myself, I've been teaching online for about 10, 11 years. Um, I started out with creating a series on uh, YouTube uh, called Clear to Loom from Scratch, teaching people how to play that wonderful piece, note for note, and I was using, using a lot of cutting edge technologies at the time, which still hold up pretty well today. And six years ago, I joined a company called ArtistWorks. I teach students around the world, and I still work there to this day. Uh, that's where I do all of my private teaching uh, through ArtistWorks. So if you're interested in any of those, I'll see if I can add some links to those resources in the notes below uh, a little bit later after the live stream. But what I wanted to do was I wanted to uh, address some specific questions that I've been getting as a result of several videos that I've been posting uh, on what you need to get together in terms of equipment and uh, software to teach your music lessons online. And uh, I started out a couple weeks ago, probably actually beginning of March, uh, I started out with the three ways that teachers can teach online. And I was showing three basic levels, starting from the very, very basic with just a laptop and a, and a tablet, all the way up to a multicam system and then the professional level system where you have multiple microphones, multiple cameras, uh, the ability to take an iPad and show the music and have that come through your video feed too. So those are some of the things that I was showing. And then I recently came out earlier this week with uh, a cheaper way of doing all of those things that I do in my most advanced studio setup uh, as a result of some folks who said they would love to be able to do those things but they simply can't afford some of the equipment that I've invested in. So that came out a few weeks ago. And as a result of a lot of these videos, I, I'm getting a lot of wonderful, wonderful questions. And I, rather than, um, and of course I can I individually answer, but I think since these questions are so good, I think it'd be helpful to answer them in this format so that lots of folks can get these answers very, very quickly. Now I just finished creating a brand new video that is in the process of being rendered right now. So while I'm waiting for it to be rendered, I thought I'd go ahead and, and just do a quick Q&A with this live session, and that way I can be productive while I'm waiting. <laughs> so anyway, I wanted to talk a little bit about some hacks that I came across with uh, my last video, specifically using a video conferencing app called Zoom. This is uh, the application that is incredibly popular right now for several reasons. Um, I know they've been coming under fire recently with some of their uh, some of the security issues, but I know they're addressing them as we speak. In fact, what was really interesting is that um, they came up with a, a, a wonderful upgrade, which this next video is going to be about. So be sure to subscribe so that as soon as that video is pop, pops up, probably a little bit later today, you can get notified so that uh, you can see that video. It's basically how can you can improve the quality of the audio uh, using Zoom on an iPad, iPhone, and an Android device. It's very exciting. It just came out yesterday, apparently. The internet was blowing up about it, and somebody told me about it this morning. So I said, OK, I'm going to make a quick tutorial on setting up Zoom's original audio settings for your iPad, iPhone, and Android device. So that's coming up real soon. So one of the hacks that I came across, oh, that, I, that I employed and demonstrated uh, a little while ago, a few days ago, was to show um, some t cheap ways that you can use inexpensive equipment to m improve the sound and have multicam capabilities and even to share your iPad sheet music. And uh, by the way, this is live, so I see I've got a couple of viewers right now. Feel free to post your questions here too. I'm gonna answer some questions that I've received in the comments of the other videos, but if you guys have any questions right now, feel free to post them here. I'm gonna do my best to, to answer them. I have a monitor so I can see your questions coming in live. That's kind of the cool thing about these live streams is that it's an interactive video. You're not just watching me passively, but it's your opportunity to interact with me and ask your questions while I'm here. Okay, so. I'm going to just read off a couple of these questions. This is from Brenda on one of the videos, uh, video comments. She's saying, 
Thank you, very helpful. Can you connect your iPad and iPhone using the same address that you originated your meeting from, or do you need to use a different email address? She's referring to the hack they came across um, that I was showing in my previous video, Cheap Ways to Teach Online Music Lessons, where if uh, I want to show a multicam view rather than uh, use, you know, here's a webcam, for example. I, I'm using this uh, Logitech Pro. It's a 1080p, but you know, even one of these things can cost $100, $200. If you don't have an extra $100, $200, but you happen to have, let's say, oh, where's my, where did my smartphone go? Oh, my smartphone is out here. But you happen to have a, like an iPhone, or in my case, I've got a Galaxy phone. If you happen to have one of these, this can be your second camera. And the way I do that, using the app called Zoom, is I simply um, add myself as another user, as another participant. So uh, imagine this. So Zoom is a video conferencing app that I, I'm finding very, very useful. And uh, they're constantly coming up with new features. And uh, you can have multiple users. Of course, primarily you're going to have the teacher and the student you know, connecting to each other. But you can also call yourself. And so when you call yourself with a smartphone, uh, you can add this camera view as the multicam view. Very, very cool stuff. So that's the hack that I came up with. And the question was, um, basically the process, and be sure to watch that video, basically the process is you're going to invite yourself uh, as another participant, okay? And you can just simply answer yourself on your smartphone, and that becomes another participant which you can switch within as a, so you switch the participant, you can pin the video, and that becomes the default view, and then switch back again within the Zoom application. So the question is, can you use the same email address, or do you need to use another one? Now, uh, in the demonstration, I used the same email address that I signed up and started the meeting from, so that should work. Um, if you want to try a different address, that might be a little bit more secure. Uh, so the answer is yes, both. You can use your own email address to add yourself in. Um, now, one interesting thing, so two interesting things. Um, I was actually running into this a little bit earlier. I don't know if they changed their security settings. So if you're having difficulty, you might want to just set up another free email account just to be safe. I was actually just running into this a few days ago where I had a second iPad. I was calling myself on that iPad, and for some reason, it wouldn't let me start the meeting because it said another meeting was already in place. Or maybe it was because I was trying to start a new meeting, uh, a new meeting on a different device. So, so that's a different issue. If you have one meeting, and from that meeting you're calling yourself or emailing yourself, you should be able to add yourself on a second device. Keep in mind, Zoom is free for two people participating. Once you add a third, Zoom will uh, impose a 40-minute limit to the session, OK? So keeping that in mind, you may, you know, if you find yourself using that, you probably have to upgrade to the professional version, which I just did last night, actually, uh, because I, I wanted to use more than one device. And when the 40 minutes came up, the, I started getting this warning that I need to upgrade if I want to keep that that other device. So it's about 14 bucks a month. You can pay for it uh, a year. If you pay for it, I think, a year in advance, it's only $12 or something like that. It's well worth it if you're going to be using Zoom as a professional tool to connect with your students. Oh, I'm getting some wonderful comments here. Hello, Emiliano, uh, asking, where can I buy this clavier piano in Mexico? Mm, very good, thank you. Uh, I'll address that question in, in a little bit. Hey, Marcus. Hi from Atlanta. Great to see you. And this is Anicito. I'm so sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Anicito from Philippines. How can you fix a hard keys? I mean, when you press it, it's not soft. That's, you know what? I'm going to get to those questions. Let me address the online. I really appreciate your comments. Thank you so much for participating. I'll see if I can turn this Q&A. Let me focus on the online lessons first, and then I'll address some of these other questions next, okay? So uh, my advice would be, if you, you can certainly, I think, still call yourself on the same email address, but it might be a good idea just for safety just to add another email address uh, and just to connect to that with your other device. Okay? It's very simple to set up another Gmail account for free. Um, so that's, that's my recommendation, okay? So next person is Myrna. Who, who is asking, who is saying, I love how you explain different ways of setting in details. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you appreciate that. So she's got two questions. Um, I have two, oh, so number one, 
how do you use the lapel mic and a USB mic simultaneously in Zoom without changing the mic source? Okay, it's a very good question. So here's the problem. Uh, you're, there is no way to do that. Uh, now, the one hack that I came across in my, in my previous video that was published on Monday was to use, I don't have it here, but it's, it, there's a Boya lapel microphone that actually has two microphones connected into one adapter. And the cool thing about that is that you can use both of those microphones at the same time. It comes with really long cables. And when you plug that in, it just comes in as a single audio source. So that's the only way that I know of to use just a microphone and not have to switch within Zoom to different audio sources if you have to switch back and forth. Now, what I have here, which you can't see right now, it's off camera, I have a mixer. That's the other option. So if you want to invest in a small mixer, uh, or I, an, another idea is to use a computer USB audio interface. With an audio interface, you can generally have at least two inputs. And to use those with regular microphones, not USB microphones, so use them with regular microphones. Uh, a USB interface, uh, which is probably going to be a little bit less expensive than a mixer, uh, or getting, getting a mixer board, that's really the only way to consolidate multiple microphones into a single audio source that you can select within Zoom. Okay? So uh, aside from that Boya dual lapel microphone, which I do have a link for in the show notes of the previous video, and again, I'll see if I can add some more links in the show notes of this live video after I'm done. Okay? So you need either a, a USB audio interface or a mixing board connected to your computer, okay? Second question, is there any way to do advanced audio settings in Zoom for students who use iPad, iPhone to make the audio sound better? Yes, and the answer is yes. I'm making the video right now. It's rendering on my computer as we speak. So the answer is now yes. Previously, it was not. When I made the video just a few days ago, it was not an option. The only way within Zoom uh, to improve the audio quality was to use a laptop or desktop computer. Here's uh, what it is. What you uh, and the previous video actually has a walk step through tutorial on setting up what we call original audio settings or original sound settings. And as I explained in that video, and I'll explain it again here, uh, what video conferencing software does is it's optimized for speaking. The microphone will listen to the audio levels of you talking, and as soon as it hears you talking, it'll raise the micro microphone volume level. As soon as you stop talking the microphone will adjust itself lower. It, what it's trying to do is trying to cut out the background noise. And there are other software filters where it tries to cut out the echo. Because those are a couple of bad things in video conferencing, echo and, um, and noise level. So it's trying to make the background noise as quiet as possible so that when you're talking, you sound very, very clear. It's great for speaking. It's not so great for music, because for music, you need to be able to hear everything, you know, especially when you're playing quietly and things get, you know, you're, you're, you don't want the microphone to sound to cut out and you miss the end of the, the note, okay? And you certainly don't want the volume level changing up and down while you're playing. So what Zoom has on the laptop and desktop version is something called Use Original Sound, where basically it just shuts off all those automatic audio adjustments and just plays the sound as it's coming in, okay? Um, now, the caveat, of course, is if you're using something like a, a tablet, I'm sorry, a, 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 a laptop built-in microphone, you're going to get the echo. You're going to get the background hums, all the background hums. You're going to hear everything, and sometimes everything's not great, which is why it's really a good idea to get a microphone to isolate your audio sources. Now, up until just yesterday, you could only do that with a laptop. Now, as of yesterday, there is new settings where you can actually turn on original sound settings now on an iPad, iPhone, and Android devices. It's very, very exciting. This new video that will be coming up later today will show you how to, set, how to find those new settings and how to activate them. Okay? And so be sure to subscribe so that as soon as that this is, uh, is available, um, be sure to subscribe and set up the notification, the little bell icon. Set that up so as soon as I post it, you'll get notified right away to have this. Okay? By the way, can just everybody let me know. Um, I don't have my headphones on. Just tell me if, you, if there are any problems with the sound settings. Can everybody hear me okay? I hope everybody can hear me through this uh, live stream. Okay? If there's any problems with the sound, can somebody write a chat in for me? Okay, I just want to make sure it's working. 
Okay, so uh, another, this person goes on. So again, is there any way to do advanced audio settings in Zoom for students who use the iPhone or the iPad to make the audio sound better? On my end, their sound is a bit unstable, kind of in and out. Again, that's the, the automatic settings. Um, one advice I have is to have the students place their device about six feet away, but that means they can't see the screen that well. If I need to demo something, share my screen or sheet music for my sheet music app on the iPad. Thanks in advance for your input. Um, so yeah, that I mean that those are all things that you know are, are part of the learning experience. Again, when we're trying to do things without buying more equipment, you know, we're going to have to work with workarounds. I mean, obviously, if we were setting up an iPad further, or an I, I, iPhone is not a great tool for online uh, music lessons because the screen is so small, all right? But you have to have it placed far enough away so you can see the instrument, see your position, right? Um, so one option is to have the, the output of the device connected to, say, a monitor, okay? Or if you have Apple TV, have that, have the screen of that output to another mic. So those are, there are workarounds, but it involves getting more equipment. So just be aware of those things. Um, again, if, you, if you're not using a separate um, micro, oh, hi, hey, Baron, how are you? Yes. He's saying, with us, online teaching is growing rapidly, but the students miss the personal presence. You know, that... That is true. I, I do understand. There is, obviously, there's a huge difference between teaching in person in the same room with your teacher. Um, but I think one of the things I also want to address is the fact that um, what, there are differences. And I'd rather not think of it as one is worse or better. I think each kind of teaching has its own advantages and disadvantages, okay? But I'd like to focus more on the advantages, what makes uh, the online experience so good, and we can get into that a little bit later, but uh, I was just doing a, a podcast interview this morning with somebody else, and that'll be coming up soon, but I was sharing a little bit about the fact that I actually, when I teach, I actually prefer teaching online. I love that experience because I can be much more focused in my teaching and the, the lesson can be recorded so that the student can watch and review that at any time. Those are all very helpful things. The multiple views I'm able to show, hi, <laughs> the multiple views I'm able to show, uh, I think give better focus, you know, because they can see my hands more clearly. I can see, you know, I can see them more clearly. They can see my hands more clearly. I can show them the pedal with another camera. I can show them the sheet music annotating. So for me, Maybe because I've become so comfortable with online teaching, I actually prefer it to live lessons. I find my live lessons actually more limiting. Isn't that funny? Uh, it's, it reminds me, it's so similar to the transition from paper music to digital sheet music. Many people find um, that, uh, that the, um, the transition is a little bit, is very different. And it is different. You know, you see only one page at a time, but you can use a device like an air turn, page turning pedal to turn pages hands free. I can mark my music in lots of different colors and I can have different versions of the music for different students so that I can not get confused with markings from one student to another. So again, differences, yes, but there can be some powerful advantages as well. Emiliano is asking, can you make more Disco Beer tutorials? Yes, I will. So, you know, uh, what's gonna be really helpful for me, Emiliano, is if you have specific questions about Disco Beer, please, you know, post them, uh, you know, on one of our channels. Visit our website at cunninghampiano.com or, you know, leave comments and post those questions. I do see all of those questions and comments. I don't always have time to answer them on the spot, but I think uh, as I try to do some more regular live stream videos, I think that's going to be a great way for me to address those questions. So, yes, if you need some more tutorials, what would be helpful for me would be for you to tell me what you have a question on. I know you're a big disco viewer guy, so I'm going to try to get to your stuff in just a bit. Okay, so thank you for your patience. Let's go on and another person, Shimron, C-S-U-E-B, says, thanks for another ter terrific video, Hugh. I've learned so much from both this video and your previous one teaching online lessons. I would have a couple of questions. If I'm using only one USB mic, oh, okay, so he's asking specifically about the uh, the blue snowball I was talking about in my previous video on cheaper ways to teach online. In the back of the blue snowball, let's see, hold, see if you can see this, there are three settings, okay, one, two, and three. 
And I tried to explain that in the video, but maybe I didn't do a good enough job. The three different settings change the, uh, change the input of the microphone. So when you're buying microphones, uh, you may, if you're looking at them, you're going to see that some of them have different kinds of uh, patterns in terms of where they're going to pick up their sounds. Okay? An omnidirectional microphone will basically pick up sound no matter where it's from in equal measure. Something that is more like a cardioid pattern will capture sound in front of it, but try to block the sound behind. So it'll mainly focus on what's in front and try to, to block out, say, the room echo. Okay? So it's great if you want to just focus on an instrument. On the other hand, let's say you're in a beautiful room with wonderful acoustics and a great echo that you want to capture, then you want to have actually more of the room sound. Okay, do you understand the difference? Omnidirectional picks up everything. Cardioid will pick up just, it's a directional microphone. So the three settings are like this. Number one, I have it set to number one right now. The number one setting is ideal, like let's say I'm talking or doing an interview or they, I want the student to hear me more clearly and I don't want the, the back of the room uh, to, to be echoey. I'll set it on number one, which is the cardioid pattern that'll just focus mainly on the sound in front of the microphone. And it'll try to minimize the sound in the back. When I set it to number two, now it's going to hear me in front, but also pick up a little bit of what's behind. Set it on number three, and now this microphone will be an omnidirectional, so that everything around me, around the microphone, will get picked up. Does that make sense? I hope that's clear. So again, in most situations, and I'll, I'll be honest, here in our show, it's not the best acoustic space, but I do a lot of videos showing, you know, demonstrating pianos. And my top secret weapon is a highly directional microphone. I actually use either microphones from Audix, I think I was demonstrating the Audix in my previous video, or I use some DPA microphones. These microphones are designed for pianos and are designed with a very specific pattern that just picks up what's right in front of it and it does a phenomenal job of cutting out everything behind it. Okay? So even though the ambient echo in this room is not great, it doesn't matter. And even though that we have like uh, air conditioners, humidifiers, background noise, you know, we've got fluorescent lights that buzz a lot. Even with all those extra distracting sounds, we may even have you know, traffic out on the street. You can hear cars whizzing by. For me, it doesn't bother me at all because my microphones are highly directional. They're only picking up what they're pointing at. Okay? So those are kind of the three. Not, not every microphone is going to have those kinds of settings, but I believe this is the Blue Snowball, which is about $60. Um, I think the, I, I don't own the Blue Yeti, but I've heard many good things about the Blue Yeti. That would be something that's more expensive, but I think that it also has multiple um, patterns, microphone patterns. So you want to look for that. The cardioid pattern is going to, oh, oh my insufficient network bandwidth. Hopefully uh, I don't get cut off. I would say hopefully the stream will be all right. I think my internet is just suffering some hiccups. So let's see. Um, so when should I use an omnidirectional setting to capture both my speaking and my playing? You know, I would experiment. Every room situation is different. You know, if you're in a noisy environment, you know, then you might want to just have the directional. If you're in a good environment and you want to use one microphone to both hear yourself and the instrument, you might want to set it to omnidirectional. I, I, can't, I think the simple answer is you've got to experiment, give it a try, and see what works best for you and your student. Okay. Another question. When using another device as an additional visual instead of a webcam, how do you over overcome the feedback issues that often come with having a mic next to a speaker? Okay. So what can happen is if you're having a mic next to your speaker, you'll, you'll get feedback because the mic is picking up the sound of the speaker. The speaker is, is reinforcing that. You'll get that horrible feedback noise. The solution to that is quite simple. Use headphones. So instead of using a speaker, use headphones so that you don't have to worry about your mic placement. The headphones will, will cut out the sound of the speaker. You'll only hear it here, and it won't get picked up into your microphone. Okay, So that's the best way. To, if you're finding that your microphone setup and your computer and speaker setup is causing a lot of feedback, 
try using headphones instead. And you may need to get a splitter, you know, depending on the setup. And again, watch the previous videos. I go into a lot of the connection issues there too. So hopefully you will find that helpful. Okay, so going on. Um, Marie is asking, she says, great video, thank you, but I have a question. Can you please recommend some economical devices we may use to position the smartphone overhead? Thanks in advance. Great, great question. So uh, one of the things I uh, am a big proponent of is multi-camera views, particularly for piano lessons. You know, so I really like having a side view so you can see, you know, like if I'm here, I like to see myself on the side a little bit higher too so you can see both right hand and left hand, not just don't get your camera too low. I like ha having it a little bit higher. Right now, this camera is a little too low, but if I have it higher, I can see kind of an angled view, so I can see my right hand and my left hand at the same time. That's ideal for the side. But I also like having an overhead cam so I can see directly above, so it's a lot easier to show and demonstrate fingerings on a piano. But how do you get your smartphone, if you're using it as an extra camera, to go overhead? Well, for example, I've got this mic stand with a boom. So the mic stand and a boom. These aren't too expensive, okay? So I would, I would definitely look for that. I, do, I believe I have links for uh, a, a pretty economical mic stand with a boom. Get this up high enough, okay, and over your head. And now, there's a couple things. Now, of course, a mic stand will not attach to a webcam or a smartphone holder. What you'll need is one other piece of equipment. And this is kind of a specialty thing. This is something, um, I can't, can't remember the name of this, but this is an adapter that will fit on top of a mic stand but the top of it is that quarter 20 screw that will fit into just about any video camera. All video cameras have uh, this, the same size screw to attach to different tripods, okay? So this will simply, so let me do this. Let me just kind of demonstrate this. So this little device, and again, I'll have links for this. I actually have links for this in the previous video, but I'll put links to this in this video as well. So this simply goes to the top of this mic stand over here, okay, like so. Right, and, and then I can attach. So you, if you're using a webcam, you can just direct, put this directly on. I actually also, you can get um, smartphone mounts. I, I didn't think to have one here. Um, actually, I have one in my bag over here. Let me see if I can fish that out for you real quick, it's just to show you. Ah, okay, let me see if I can find it. It's in here somewhere. Thanks, guys. Okay, let's see. Is it in here? It's, maybe it's in the lower pocket. Let's see if I can find this. Ah, here it is. So this is not a standard-looking one, but um, you can get similar things. Um, but this is, for instance, this is a smartphone mount. Okay, just kind of a little spring on top. And again, look at that. So that will fit right on the the little screw over here. I just screw this on over here, like so. And this is a ball, ball bearing, so you can adjust the angle. And I just tighten, I just tighten it over here. Okay. Now I've got a smartphone mount. Let's get my smartphone, take it out of its cover. Now watch this. So now what I do is I simply kind of do that. There, I've got my, and I just set it up to the right height and angle. And with you know with the ball bearing, you can set the angle this way. You can tilt this, of course, as well. So you can you know, fiddle around until you find the right height and the right angle. And that's the way I do actually a lot of my regular video overhead shots. I, just, I use my smartphone and that, that boom microphone. So that's one great option. Now, there's another option you can use is to, if you know this is going to be a permanent thing, uh, actually in my home studio, I have a ceiling mount. I actually have, a, a, I just have something you drill into your ceiling. It's a permanent fixture. And those are good particularly if you are using a heavier camera. I actually have a professional camcorder for my overhead view uh, with the video feed going out into my whole mixing system. But because I'm teaching, uh, that's, you know, that's what I do for you know, part of my living, um, I, I know that's a permanent thing that I need to have. So I actually have that just mounted on my ceiling. Those ceiling mounts are not too expensive either. So, and, and you can get some with the same kind of ball joints. So if you need to attach a smartphone holder, you could do that. Okay, so those are some of the components you're going to need to get your smartphone uh, overhead. Now, I've seen some creative things. I saw um, some teachers are using like um, car mounts, you know, the suction cup car mounts. And they, if they happen to have a like some uh, like a glass cabinet or something, you put the mount right on there. The only thing that gets me nervous about that is that 
over time, those suction mounts can lose their suction. If your phone falls, you might damage your phone. I, I, I am not a fan of that system. I mean, suction mounts are not a great idea. So if you can have some sort of a, a safe, secure mount, you know, phones are not cheap. <laughs> so that's what I would recommend, OK? Um, let's see. So here's another great question. What equipment should the piano student have besides the laptop or the iPad? Um, and this kind of goes back to the fact that I think it's really helpful to have some sort of microphone. Now, um, a lot of the USB microphones, I'll, I'll confess, I haven't really tested USB microphones, say, going into my iPad over here. But I, I think I'm going to uh, do a test in a future video just to, just to double check. I, know, I have tested my Boya microphone. That Boya dual lavalier microphone will work uh, with my smartphone, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pretty. And it, I have tested it on my iPad, so I know that works. So I, if that works, I'm reasonably sure that most other USB microphones will work. But let me test it, okay? Um, so I would recommend some sort of microphone, okay? Ideally, something. Oh, Chris, thank you so much for letting me know about the sound. I really appreciate that. So uh, I would recommend for your student. Uh, a microphone. Like I said, uh, my previous video on cheaper ways to teach music lessons online, it's not just for teachers, but also for students. If the student can have a, a microphone, at least, uh, and I go through a whole range of microphones, from microphones that are about $150 all the way down to $30 or $40 or so. And you can, you know, the nice thing about that video is you can hear the sound quality and compare them between all the different microphones. And I would just, you know, make a recommendation that uh, to make the lessons sound better, that they consider making, you know, investing in a microphone. And the way I would also phrase it would be that it's not just for the lesson, but if they want to ever, and this is something that I think teachers need to be aware of. We're entering uh, a remarkable period where we're all having to adjust to these new technologies very, very quickly, uh, which is reinforced the point that I've actually tried to make for many, many years is that technology is so critical for music, for education, but also for production. We're now becoming producers. And the teachers that can help teach their students to become their own creators, yeah, their own content creators to create their own videos, their own music content, they're going to want to get a good microphone so that they sound good. If the student wants to you know, show off their song on YouTube, you need to sound good, right? And the sound is, is actually one of the, the biggest things that affects the quality of the video. So for their own benefit, having a microphone is going to be a great idea. So that would be the number one thing that I would recommend the student have would be a microphone. Now, um, here's, again, if, if there are options, if there are more options, here's another thing that I would consider you know, asking the student. If the student has access to a second iPad, or let's say they're shooting themselves with an iPhone and they have an iPad, okay? Another thing to th consider would be to have okay, the, the phone as the camera and the iPad for the sheet music. Now, the reason I say that is a couple reasons. <clears throat> Number one, having their whole library is great. Okay? Instead of looking for books and forgetting their music, having their, all of their music on one iPad means their whole library comes with them wherever they go. There's another app that I talk about in the previous video called Music. This is an app that's been around for a few years. And I've been in touch with the developers from Paris, and they've been showing me some really cool things about the app, which was designed from the ground up to be a collaborative app, meaning it's very popular in Europe, apparently. A lot of orchestras and the opera houses use it because they can share the, the music with all the members. And if there are annotations or notes, those notes can be instantly synchronized among team members, among ensemble members. You can do the same thing as a teacher and student. So if both of you have iPads, an extra iPad for sheet music. Uh, you can get music um, and share sheet music through projects. So if the teacher is making an annotation, they synchronize it, instantly gets synchronized to the student's iPad as well. So the student can see what the teacher's writing instantly, and vice versa. And so uh, you can think of some really fun activities that involve, you know, let's say you want to ask the student, OK, Take the here. Here's the music now. I want you to write the names of the notes, okay? And you can the student can write it down, synchronize it. You see their answers, and you can help correct them right away. Or you can say things like, "Well, 
let's have a little written exam. Let's see, uh, here's a 4-4 here's a, you know, four, four measure. I've got a quarter note and an eighth note. What are some other note values you can use to fill up the rest of this measure? And they can you know, draw their own note. Any kind of drawing writing activity now becomes really interactive if you are both using music and synchronizing the, your whatever you know, music or activity sheets, you can, any kind of PDF file you want to create, you can share that back and forth. Very, very powerful. That's something that if your student has access to an iPad and you have an iPad and you can use that app together, that, I, I think that would be so, so amazing for online teaching. Great activities you can think of beyond just simply playing and listening, okay? So those are the questions I have prepared. Now let's kind of address some of the other questions now. Um, and Sito, I'm not quite sure I understand. How do you fix a hard key? I and mean, when you press it, it is not soft. Hmm. In other words, OK, I guess I'm, I'm thinking, if I understand your question, please correct me if I'm wrong. My, I'm guessing that when you're pushing the piano and it sounds hard or it sounds very bright and tinny. How do you fix that? Well, if you're working with an acoustic piano, uh, the, the, when you push a key down, it's throwing a hammer. And that hammer is made of wood, but it's also covered with felt. Okay? And the felt then strikes the string and creates the sound. Now, over time, that felt will become kind of dampened down, will become hard, and everything gets compressed. And it gets hard. Okay? And then when it gets hard, the sound becomes hard. So what you need to do is you need to ask a technician to do what we call a voicing. And what they do is they use a special tool, and the, one of the most common tools for that is a needler. It's like a, a handle with three very thin needles that come out, and they literally poke the felt at different points to soften the felt up again, loosen the fibers, and restore the, you know, the, just, just the softness of the felt. And when you do that, with a, that's called voicing. You do that for every single hammer and you just loosen the fibers up, and then once they do that, it's incredible, it's amazing the difference in sound quality that you'll get after a good voicing. So I guess if, if this is the correct question, my answer would be to make a piano that sounds hard, sounds soft again, see if you can get the felts uh, needled and voiced to soften up those fibers, and that would be the best way uh, to make that hard piano sound soft again. Okay, now let's go on. Where can I buy a disc of your piano in Mexico? You know, that's a really good question. Um, I know the Yamaha dealer site shows dealerships in the United States. I'll be honest, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I'd have to do some research on that for you, okay? Um, I'm assuming you've probably done some research. I really don't know what the Mexico Yamaha dealership structure is like. I mean, we've got a very extensive network worldwide of Yamaha, especially here in the United States. Mexico, I'm not so sure. So, um, uh, Emiliano, if you want to send me an email, okay? I think maybe we communicate, but if you want to send me an email, you can send it to Hugh, H-U-G-H, at Cunningham Piano, C-U-N-N-I-N-G-H-A-M, piano.com. Hugh at Cunningham Piano.com. Um, ask me your question again, and I, will, I can do some more research on the back end uh, for you in terms of seeing if I can help you find a dealer near Mexico. I'm guessing maybe Texas? But I'm not sure. Okay, so I'll, let me see if I can do some homework on that for you. And which discovery do you recommend? Well, uh, that's a really good question because the, the disc clavier is available uh, in grand pianos of all different sizes, and they're also available in upright pianos. So the answer is it depends. It depends what kind of piano you want. Now, there are also different levels of disc clavier. There are the most basic level of disc clavier will only play back the music, okay? Um, and that's, of course, the, the least expensive, but it won't record, okay? It'll only play. So if you want a disc clavier that records, then you need to get uh, the disc clavier, the, so the, the player-only version or one that records. Now, even with the recording function, once you get into the higher level grand pianos, uh, I believe it starts with the C3X, then you get into the professional level recording, which it's even higher resolution. Um, so, like I said, it, the answer is it depends. It depends on what size piano you want, whether you want it to be able to record, whether you just want it to play back. If you are, you know, just 
teacher, student, that you're just learning, just having fun, you may be the, the, um, the basic level of recording, it should be fine. If you're a professional and you need the Discovere for making albums or recording, and I, I've done this many times where I've cr actually recorded albums, but I'll use the professional level disc clavier because that will be able to, t to be much more sensitive. Okay, so for a top producer or record studio, I would highly recommend getting a top level recording um, disc clavier. So the, the answer again is it depends, and so maybe if you can email me, let me know what you're looking for. First of all, in a piano and then we can help determine what level of this clavier would be best for you, okay? Uh, the real the real burned, oh, do you have more? <laughs> I, I have two burns here. Thanks for sharing your setup. Give, gave us nice input for live call teaching. Oh, well, I'm so glad you found this helpful, Baron. Are there two Barons or is this one Baron with two, two, uh, <laughs> two accounts? In any case, I'm so glad you found this helpful. All right, uh, let's see. Can I make more disc clear two tutorials? I think those are all of the online chats that I see at this time. Um, so yeah, I'm so glad you found me helping, sharing my setup helpful. Like I said, this new tutorial on setting up Zoom for the best sound quality for your iPad, iPhone, and Android device. It's, I, it's just finished rendering. I'm gonna do a little bit of editing and it'll come up in just, uh, probably just a couple of minutes. So if you want to subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you can know as soon as it's ready, uh, you, you can get on top of that. So I just want to open it up. I've got about 10 people here, I think, in the room. Are there any other last questions about teaching music online or anything piano related or anything else? I'm here for you guys, yeah? Uh, and I, I love this live video format. It's really great to have this virtual conversation with folks all around the world. So. Again, is there, if there's any, does anybody else have any questions? Does anybody else need to know anything? Okay, well, I want to make a quick announcement for those of you who are Facebook users. This coming Monday, we are going to be hosting a live version of the Cunningham Piano Show. I'm really, really excited. So this coming Monday, April 13th, 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. If you're on Facebook, um, please visit the Cunningham Piano. I think it's the facebook.com forward slash Cunningham Piano Company forward slash live. If you go there, you'll be able to see the upcoming, we'll be able to watch our live streaming video. It's going to be a live show featuring an amazing musician. His name is Craig Knudsen. Craig Knudsen is just, he's, he's um, one of the most amazing people I've ever met. He has been working in the music industry for 30 plus years. He is one of Yamaha's top inventors, consultants, developers. He's invented some of the things that we see on every clavinover in the world. He's invented follow the lights and if you have a disc clavier, uh, he's also developed smart key um, and where the, the, the disc clavier will wiggle keys to show you which notes to play. It's great for learning. Ah, sorry. Hey, the, so the real burned is asking, did you try gaming headsets? for students. No, but that's a great idea. Really, really great idea. So gaming headsets basically have headphones and a microphone. I think that that, that would be ideal. Um, the thing to, so those, usually those should be able to go right into your laptop headsets. Now the only question I have is whether those gaming headsets would work on an iPhone or an iPad. Now with some of the newer iPhones and iPads they have only USB-C adapters. They've gotten rid of the headphone jack. Uh, I don't have it here, but I actually you can actually get um, headphone adapters, which it plugs into the, head, to the USB-C port and it has a little mini headphone jack, so you can actually plug in those kinds of devices. So you probably would need that in addition. But yeah, I can see that working beautifully. That's a great, yeah, a nice cheap combination between headphones and at least a better microphone than built microphones. So the only thing with the gaming headset is that it's going to be great for the voice. Um, and my guess is, for gaming headsets, the, it, the microphone is probably going to be very hot, very directional. It's going to be a, probably a dynamic microphone. So there are two different, also two different kinds of, um, of microphones. There are what we call dynamic microphones and condenser microphones. Dynamic microphones are less sensitive, okay? And that may sound like a bad thing, but it's actually good because it'll, it's really good for picking up sound sources that it's very close to, like drums, vocals. And what it does, because it's less sensitive, it won't pick up other surrounding noise, okay? 
So it's probably really good for your voice. I'm not sure it would be good for the instrument, unless the instrument's really, really close. Okay? Condenser microphones are much more sensitive. They usually require a power source, you know, usually a 48-volt power source, to run and activate the microphone. Okay? Those, so um, those microphones tend to be much more sensitive. So they'll pick up more sound around you. So gaming headphones, headsets might be cheaper, but I could also see it being great for the voice, but maybe problematic for the instrument. Again, I think it all depends. Okay, so again, one of the interesting things about technology is there are lots of ways to kind of mix and match. So my recommendation is if you have one, try it. If you don't have it, I'm not sure you need to go out and get one because I'm not sure that's an optimal solution. But again, I would always advise start with what you have and then add on as you need or as you, know, as you perceive different situations, okay, and then and just give it a try. All right, so Hunty Boy is asking, how about, can, can you talk about software that shows a digital version of what you're playing? Ah, so yes, okay, so there's a, a wonderful developer. Uh, his, his name is George Litterst, and he has developed a whole suite of programs. Uh, you want to visit a website called Time Warped Technologies. Um, there are a couple of programs that I come to mind. One is Classroom Maestro, and the other one is Home Concert Extreme. Home Concert Extreme is probably the one I would, that, what, so let me uh, kind of backtrack a little bit. Um, oh, you're welcome, Baron. Okay, the rail burned. Um, when you go to my Claire de Lune from Scratch video series, and especially, it's interesting because I started out using some technology, and as I was filming the videos, you know, I, I discovered other programs and other things, and so the videos actually get better and better towards the end, but you kind of watch from the middle or towards the last few videos, you'll see me using some of George's software, where I connected my piano to my computer, and the computer was then showing a graphical representation of what I was playing. I think that's what I'm, that's what Hunty Boy is, uh, is, is referring to. So I would play the notes, but then you also see the graphics of which notes I was pushing down, as well as a graphic of the pedals. That I, I believe the pro the program I used for that was called Home Concert Extreme, is with an X Extreme Home Concert Extreme. And so, um, give take a look at that. I think that's the program that would be really really helpful for you. Another program is called Classroom Maestro. Oh, you're welcome, Hunty Boy. Cla no, Classroom Maestro is really interesting. It's really designed for classrooms, but you can use it in an online teaching situation too. What's different about that is that it's designed to show, it's, I don't know if, you, if you, so for those of you who have done the old traditional uh, classroom piano class, group piano classes, the teacher will sometimes have a board and a big blackboard or, or sometimes, and they'll show you the notes. Classroom Maestro will do, uh, will show like chords, so you push a chord down and it'll tell you what chord that is. Very, very cool. Or if you're playing a scale, it'll show you the notes of that scale, what key you're in. So it's, it's great, for, great for theory. Or if it's just individual notes, it'll just, you push a note down, it'll show you the notes, it'll also show you intervals, okay? Great teaching tool. Um, have I tried running both of those programs at the same time? I imagine you can probably run both of them at the same time. Haven't tried it, but it might be something cool. But, so check that out, Time Warp Technologies. Just Google that. And uh, Classroom Maestro, Home Concert Extre Extreme would be two great programs to try out for online demonstrations that shows digital versions of what you're playing. Um, uh, yeah, so, so check that out. You can see demonstrations of it on my Claire to Learn from Scratch videos. Um, boy, some great, great questions. I really appreciate uh, everybody's feedback here. Thank you so much. Are uh, there any other last questions? I'm going to close up in just a few minutes. If there's any last questions before I end up, uh, Again, I just want to remind everybody, this coming Monday, April 13th, 7 p.m., on the Cunningham Piano Facebook page, go to facebook.com forward slash Cunningham Piano Company forward slash live, okay? We're, this coming Monday at 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, we're going to be featuring Craig Knudsen. This is going to be a really cool episode. It's going to be a live show on Facebook, and just like this, it's going to be an opportunity for folks to ask questions, we're going to have feedback, yeah, a question and answer session, but Craig is going to be performing. Now, he's not coming here, he lives in California. So I'm going to be bringing him in through the magic of technology, and I'm going to be interviewing him from here while he's in California. He's going to perform, we're going to hear his music, stream through the show, 
And basically, I have a virtual multicam operation that I'm setting up for him and me. And Craig was uh, a, a little bit of boasting. Craig was pretty blown away when he saw how I was, I'm able to set that up. So uh, that's not a feature you can normally do on Facebook Live, but I figured out a hack to do multi-camera views. So I'll be controlling multiple cameras on his end and streaming all of that. So you really want to check this out. This is a really cool application. I don't think anybody, maybe you guys can tell me, if you've ever seen a Facebook Live show where you can see multiple cameras from different locations around the world all at the same time, let me know. Because I don't, I mean, I, of course you can do it in studio if you have a, you know, if you have a full production board and you know, full team. Yes, professionals can do that, but you know, I'm just doing this on the fly and I'm able to do it uh, through multiple locations. So we're gonna have Craig, I'll be controlling his cameras. He's gonna be performing, demonstrating some amazing things that you can do with Clavinovas. The guy's an amazing musician, an incredible innovator for music technology and music education. And he's also, I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, have you heard of the Piano Guys? The Piano Guys are one of the biggest acts. Uh, they, they became very, very famous for their incredible YouTube videos a pianist and a cellist, and they just perform all over the world. They're huge on, on YouTube. Craig is the tech guy for the Piano Guys. Very, very close. He works very, very closely with the, the Piano Guys team, um, and he, 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 they work, they were, he works with them, you know? And so he does all the technology consulting for them, and so he's got some great insights into the piano guys. So if you're a fan of those guys, you can ask him questions about that. I'm sure he'd love to you know, share his stories about them. But uh, yeah, great, great guy, wonderful musician, terrific person. And I'm so excited to have him as a very, very special guest on the Cunningham Piano Show Live. Again, this coming Monday, April the 13th, 7 p.m. on our Facebook page, okay? So be sure to to look for us on Facebook, look for the live page, and make sure you, you set yourself a reminder so you can be here when we stream the show live from here and from California simultaneously. It's going to be very, very cool. Okay, let's see. One more thing from The Real Burned. My wife has several students with e-piano and low-quality mic on their cell phone. Is it possible to connect the e-piano directly to the smartphone to get a better sound via Zoom? So you have to help me. What is an e? Are you talking about an electronic piano? So is an elect? Because I'm not sure what an e piano is. If it's a if it's a software piano, then. <laughs> um, and Christine Yee says, "Thank you so much. Your video really helped me to set it online." Oh, Christine, I'm so glad you found this helpful. And yeah, I mean, I've been hearing from folks all over the world, and I'm so glad you found this helpful. That's. You know, I, as I was saying at the beginning of this live stream broadcast, uh, I've been doing this for, for many, many years, but I've been involved with very heavily with cutting edge music technology for, for over 20 years, you know, and so I'm so happy that I can help share. I know, I know. Oh, electronic piano. Okay, great. So, uh, low quality microphones. So, let's, let's address the question about improving the sound quality when the student's just using a smartphone. You're right, this, the smartphone itself is not, doesn't have a great, uh, it's designed for the voice. It's not really designed for uh, for music. So uh, the real Baron, I'm just going to call you Baron. I hope you don't mind. Like I said, this new video should help. The video is talking about using Zoom, but now you can turn on original sound settings. So most likely you won't get the cutout that happens with a smartphone. What the smartphone is doing with Zoom is it's adjusting the volume levels constantly, which is horrible for music. With this new setting that just came out yesterday, you'll be able to turn that off, and whatever comes into it should come out much more authentically. Yes, if you can get a if your student can get a microphone, that would be a huge, huge help. Okay, and like I said, the Boya double lavalier microphone is only forty dollars. Okay, and I'll have a link to that. I have a link to that actually in my previous video, um, but I'll, I'll put the link in there here again as well. The Boya microphone is a double lavalier. So they can have one, and it's got very, very long cable. It, it's designed to, to plug into smartphones. Okay, it's a great microphone. So I would recommend if you can look for that, uh, get the link to that, get the Boya double lavalier. They can put one microphone on themselves and the other microphone, you know, by the electronic piano. And that way, it's very cheap. They don't have to get a lot of equipment. They just plug it right into their phone. They might need an adapter if it's uh, if it, if they don't have a headphone jack. They might need to have 
um, uh, an adapter to get into the whatever port that is. But that's easy to find. I'll have a link to that as well. But having a, having a double microphone would really, really help the quality of the sound. Now keep in mind, um, they might have to adjust the volume levels. I was, if you hear, if you hear the demonstration that I did in the last video, the Boyo's very sensitive. It's a, it really picks up. It's very loud. So you might have to turn the volume down on the input uh, on the phone. But I think that would be a great, great solution rather than just relying on the phone's internal microphone itself. Does that help, Baron? I hope that. Let me know if that helps. Okay. Um, great. Every time I say we're going to end, <laughs> another question pops in. So I'll wait a few more minutes. Okay, uh, so Baron, just let me know if that suggestion helps. Okay. Um, so yeah, and there are other, I know another friend of mine was telling me about other dedicated smartphone microphones. Uh, I know the iPhone has specific microphones too, but again, the Boya is kind of a universal thing. I really, I, I've used the, the single lavalier version a lot. I've used the double lavalier version a couple of times for interviews too. I think it's a great inexpensive microphone. It's not the best quality, but it's a lot better than just what you're going to get on, on a smartphone. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question there. Does anybody else have any other questions? Okay, we've got a couple of people here. Directly connecting the electronic piano with the cable to the smartphone. Um, not, um, so what you're, so what Baron is asking is if there is a way to connect the smart, the electronic piano directly to the smartphone. Uh, there is a complicated answer and there's an easy answer. The complicated answer is, look, you can get, um, oh, I'm so glad you find it helpful. So if you want to go all out, yes, you can get digital mixers, but I don't think your student wants to buy a mixer for the phone. It's, it's a little bit of an overkill. So yes, there are professional mixing devices, but like I said, no, uh, so what, let's, let's go top level, okay? So if you wanted to co directly connect the electronic piano with a cable into the smartphone, you would need some sort of an audio, digital audio interface, okay, which I believe there are. Um, which would go into whatever port there is, and those interfaces will have a couple of ports. So what you would do is you take um, the uh, external, you know, if the electronic piano, not all electronic pianos have this, but the electronic piano has an auxiliary output, you'd use the cable to go into the audio interface, the audio interface goes into the smartphone, and then you get the top quality sound. Like I said, I think that's overkill. So what we were talking about here is just an acoustic microphone. You just set the microphone near, you know, somewhere near the speakers pointed towards the piano, acoustic or electronic, it doesn't matter, okay? And then the other microphone, the voice. So these are just acoustic microphone situations. This is not a direct cable connection. You can do direct cable connections, but like I said, that means some sort of a, a digital audio interface, okay? Now, um, one interesting option is, and I don't, <laughs> Next time I have to think of this, I have to bring all my gear here with me or within reach. Um, there are digital microphones like Zoom. The, uh, I have a Zoom H6n um, that can actually, it's not just a digital recorder, but also can act as a digital interface, okay? So you can get cheaper versions of that. The Zoom 6n has like you know, four inputs, XLR inputs. You can add two more with attachments. That might be overkill, but you might get, be able to get like an inexpensive Zoom a smaller one that can also act as a digital interface, okay? Um, I used to have the H4n. I think those are not so expensive nowadays. They're, they're, I'm not sure they're even still making them. The H4n, again, can also act as an interface. So you, again, if you have the outputs, the audio cable, like you know, quarter inch auxiliary outputs from the electronic piano, that could go into a Zoom, which can act as a digital interface. That can then go into your computer, I imagine also, you know what, I'm going to do a test. You know, let's do this as a, as a real test. I, I don't want to say that it could work if I'm not having tested this. I'm going to test this out, see if I can play around with some other digital audio interface options specifically for smartphones. I've got an iPad. I've got a couple of iPads I, and for the iPad as well. So I think that would be really, really helpful, okay? Yes, best player, I'm live. And Monique, yay, I'm so glad you found this helpful. Yay. <laughs> um, yes, I'm live. Uh, I'm, it was just kind of a random thing. I was in the middle of making a video about Zoom's new uh, original audio setting. They just added for iPhones, iPads, and Android things yesterday, which is going to greatly improve the quality of the audio for our online lessons. And while I was waiting for this render, I thought, hey, I'm here. I've got all my equipment. So I just did this impromptu live streaming sessions to answer some questions. Um, 
Yes, looking for cheap options for the students with auxiliary to headphone jack. Yeah, so that's what I, that's what I would look at. And rather than a direct input, I, I would recommend a microphone. Okay, but just a cheap microphone. I, I think you'd be really impressed at how much better it sounds. The direct lines get complicated, and the reason you would you want to use that is really for recording. Okay, let's say you're, you know, if you your student wants to make a professional level or a semi-professional level recording, then you're going to want to have some sort of a direct line in for the most control of the sound. Does that make sense? Okay, so they're using a Steinberg interface for the microphones. So for the students, a cheap mic would be the better option. Again, yes, I think so. You know, if it, it, as a teacher, I'm, you know, I, I, I really want to be sensitive, particularly during this, this crazy time. I want to be sensitive to the, the, the financial uh, means of my students. And I would much, and here's an interesting thing as a teacher. Um, I, I, in my online lessons, I, I, I never have a requirement for what kind of a piano you need to take lessons with me through ArtistWorks. I've seen you know, people with like these little rinky-dink tiny toy keyboards, and that's fine. Really, it's fine. It's OK. And the sound quality for most of the students is, is not great. But you know, I'm OK. Maybe because I'm so used to it as a digital teacher, I'm so used to hearing such a wide variety of audio input. So it doesn't bother me so much. And I, and I have a, a trained enough ear that I can hear what needs to be heard. Um, and it, you know, I was going to actually, at a demonstration, I was actually going to do a presentation for some traditional music teachers. And I didn't do this, but one of the things I was going to do is I was going to play some old recordings from some old 48s or some old records. You know, when you hear the crackle and hiss and pop, but I'm going to play, you know, maybe I would play uh, some, some famous pianists' early recordings or famous singers. And I was going to ask the question, can you hear the musicianship through this old recording, you know, from some, like the 1920s, 1930s? And I would guarantee you they would all say, oh, yes, especially if they heard the famous name that was associated with the recording. They would say, oh, of course you can hear the musicianship. And then say, well, if you can hear, oops, I'm sorry, YouTube is not, not a video. OK, so my apologies. You guys might be having some streaming issues. So if there's some hiccups, please forgive me. Uh, I think I'm just having a, uh, having a poor reception. My, Anyway, so the point being is that if, if we can hear the musicianship in an old recording, which has much lower resolution than even a smartphone, you know, if you can hear the musicianship there, you know, as a teacher, you should be able to hear the musicianship in any device. Okay? So I think we, we prejudice our hearing sometimes. Okay? So that's just my personal opinion. Now, having said that, um, so again, I, I always, you know, with my students, they're welcome to play whatever they have. And I would never pressure my students to upgrade their instruments. What usually happens is as their ears develop and as they improve their skills, they end up saying, you know, I, I can hear why my instrument's not so great. And I, I want to get a better instrument. Can, do you have any recommendations? And then I can step and say, well, you know, depending on your budget, this is what I recommend. Try this, try that, right? And so I always let, let the student guide. And if they feel the incentive to improve their equipment, I'm happy to help and because um, Especially as they hear other students, you know, interfacing, you know, with the online lessons, they can hear the difference in quality, and they want to sound good. That's the whole point. If your students want to sound good, then you can be the guide to give them the uh, the best options. And so, hopefully, what I'm sharing in terms of the options that I've used will help you to make those recommendations for your students when they're ready. Okay, rather than saying you must have this sort of piano, you must have these mics, and sort of to, to study with me. Well. Again, it's all up to you. If you want to set yourself up as a premium teacher that's, you know, that wants to have you know, a certain kind of student, that's your prerogative. You can certainly do that. Uh, maybe for me, I, uh, maybe I'm a little bit weird, but I love teaching beginners. I love, te I love the challenge of working with people. I, I guess my, my thinking is I want to find, out, find a way to teach everybody to play the piano, to everybody to make music. And the more universal I can make it, you know, then gradually they, you know, if they want better quality, of course I can help them get better quality. But I'd rather they start with what they have, what they can afford, and then build them up from there, and then meet them at you know, their needs. But first of all, first and foremost, make it a fun experience. Help them discover the joy of making music, and that's one of the things I really am very thankful for making that Claire de Lune from Scratch series was the premise that hey, anybody can play this piece. Everybody can play this piece. Just give me enough time. Just watch my lessons, you know, and and a little bit of patience, you can do it too. And 
the, the, it's just been so refreshing to hear from people that say, oh my goodness, I can play the piano. I can make beautiful music. And they're like, yes, you can. That's great. Isn't that great? Let's do some more. <laughs> so it's just, for me, that is the most thrilling experience. More than playing in Carnegie Hall, more than this or that. That moment when somebody who, particularly somebody who says, you know, I have no talent. And for me to say, it doesn't matter. You can still play the piano. And to have them go, I can't, and the emotions that come out of that. Oh, I love that. For me, that is the most fulfilling feeling in the world. Chris is asking, do you intend launching a virtual piano group project similar to the virtual orchestra last week? What a great question. That was actually an internal question that we were asking here at Cunningham Piano, uh, because we're a piano store. <laughs> and um, the answer is yes, I think so. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm tr I have a couple of ideas I'm thinking. You know, I'm actually I'm, I'm doing a top secret project right now that's involving multiple pianos around the world. I guess it's not so top secret anymore since I just talked about it. But yeah, so I'm in the process of doing that. But that's actually got me thinking that you know, maybe I could do this with pianos everywhere. Might be could be a lot of fun. So Chris, that's a great idea, um, and um, I, you might maybe. Did I talk about that here? Oh, I mean, I, I was talking about this. I just did a podcast interview right before doing this show, and I was talking about this experience that I had working with students where um, I, I actually ended up arranging a Beatles song, but like 16 tracks. And the, each track was tailored to the level of the student with what they could play. Like some students could only like play literally one note a measure, which is fine. Other students were able to maybe do block chords. Other students were more advanced, could do the like real melodic stuff. What was really great about it is that the, 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 each line was tailored to each student, so every student could really participate according to what they could do. And they were, they, and everybody was important. We needed everybody, no matter what their level, and they all felt like they could musically be a part of an integral part of the group. So, Chris, I think the answer is: is who can join this? I'm, I'm going to say everybody. Everybody who has a piano. Um, my 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 one concern is going to be. It's one thing when we have. Um, well, the the main concern. Well, you know what? I, I I'm going to I'm going to think through this. But if you guys, oh Chris, I'm so glad. Yes, the orchestra. That was an amazing project. And the thing I'm most proud about. And this, if you guys don't know about this, this was um, a video I produced uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, which, which brought together 111 musicians from nine countries, 18 states in the United States. I even had musicians from China participating. It was so cool, so moving. And, um, but I had these music, you know, orchestra, chorus, and what was really cool was the fact that it was open to everybody. It was not just professionals. Of course, I, you know, being a professional, I was able to tap a couple of uh, friends for favors. I had, you know, uh, some principal musicians from the Philadelphia Orchestra join in. I had Blair Tyndall, who is an oboist and the author of Mozart in the Jungle. She contributed the track. So I pulled some favors from some really powerful friends. Jasmine Choi, who is an international flutist, a good friend of mine, she contributed a track for fun. But besides those people, everybody was invited to join. I had retirees. I had some people like, you know, the oldest person I think was 72 years old. The youngest was a nine-year-old kid playing the cello just getting started. I loved it. It was so wonderful. It was so beautiful is that everybody of all different levels was able to participate. You know, we found the perfect piece I think that everybody could do something in, right? And the blend of all those voices was just wonderful. So to that end, um, Berend, I, I think I would like to do something very similar where it's open for everybody. I would, I, that would be my goal. I would want pianists around the world to join in. And so I think the trick is going to be um, creating an arrangement that can fit the level of everyone. That's my thinking. Okay, so you can pick a part, play what you want, and then you know, we'll, 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 I, I think I think we'll make it work. I think we'll make it work. So yes, I, I think the answer is yes. This will happen. Um, I need to find the brain space <laughs> and the time to to come up with the project. But yeah, I think that would be. Wouldn't that be fun? 
let's say we had you know a hundred pianists from around the world, all different levels, all different ages, and you just you know that can create you know a really simple part. If you just want to play one note a measure, you know, and just follow along, keep the beat for us, that would be really cool. You know, other people can maybe play chords, other people can play the melodic stuff, and maybe we can find something really really cool. So let me give that some thought. I want to find something really fun for everybody, and if necessary, I can create the arrangement, split it out in a couple of different ways so that people of all different levels could participate. Oh, that would be that would be really cool. So let me give it some thought. So do me a favor, tell your friends, you know, the more people that tell me they want to do this, the more people that tell me they want to do this, the more inspired I'll be to actually make it happen, okay? How about that? <laughs> By the way, I don't know if you know this, the backstory of this. The whole orchestra uh, video project was really just in response to a question from one of you guys. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I was putting out these tutorials for helping teachers to teach online, and one of them reached out to me and said, well, I teach a choir. You know, I, I, these tutorials are great for teaching one-on-one. -on -one. This one teacher from Canada got in touch with me and said, well, I teach a choir, and we're in quarantine. I can't meet my kids. How can I teach a group of musicians? So I thought, you know, rather than just kind of give her the answers, why don't I make this project so that I can, by in the process of making it, I can create these tutorials. And so that's really the origin, is because one of you guys said, can we do this? And you guys have just inspired me, so thank you so much. So tell more people, if you guys want more pianists to join my virtual piano orchestra, let me know, and I think I'll, I'll come up with something really cool and fun for all of us to try. Wouldn't that be great? Ah, oh, it would be so much fun. Anyway, so yes, so, so tell everybody to, to subscribe and message me and, and bother me. The more people that bother me to do this, the more I'm going to feel obligated to get this done. And I would love to do that. So I'm so glad you guys enjoyed it. If you haven't seen it, please check it out. I think um, the title is, And Now Mozart at a Social Distance, uh, a virtual orchestra or something like that. So it's a performance of Mozart's wonderful Ave Verum Corpus for choir and orchestra, beautiful orchestra arrangement. And oh, by the way, if you guys see that video, um, you should really watch it with headphones. In the beginning, um, if you see the video, you see one violinist start, and then another violinist, and the vocal, one instrument at a time. And in the beginning, you're hearing just the basic audio. I didn't, you know, it's just the raw, kind of the raw audio that were coming from smartphones and laptops and, and webcams and things like that. So that you hear, it's, it's kind of, you know, not great, but on purpose. And so you hear, what you hear is a one person by themselves, then two, three, four, and then one at a time I'm bringing these instruments in. And as they come in, the music sounds, you know, more rich and more full and more beautiful. And then the halfway point, I, I then reveal the full stereophonic audio spectrum where I do the full processing, full cleanup, and I actually have all the instruments, just like you would find in an orchestra, in a stereo pan. So the, the sopranos are going to be on the far, um, on the far left, and the altos, tenors, bass on the far right over there, and then same thing, you know, the, the, the violins are going to be the far left, first violins, second violins, violas, and then the basses are going to be, and you hear this, when you, in the middle of the piece, if you're hearing headphones, you're going to hear this bloom of the sound, and it's like, I think what's really cool is that even though nobody was very, I, I think maybe just one or two people used semi-professional equipment, most, most everybody else is just using smartphones and laptops. Even with just that stuff, I was able to clean up the audio and make it sound <laughs> pretty cool. So you hear the sound bloom in the middle of the piece, and the second, when you watch the credits, that's the full performance from the beginning with everybody mixed in. So do watch that again with headphones. I think you're going to really uh, enjoy it a lot more. It's a lot of fun. Okay. So let's see. Any other questions? Boy, this ran a lot longer than I thought. Any other questions? Last questions before I close off for the day. Uh, again, my name is Hugh Sung. I'm with Cunningham Piano. We're, we're officially closed, but I've turned the store into my own personal man cave. Let's see. Oh, your wife wants to join. Oh, on the piano, we would love to have your wife join. That would be great, you know. Um, I, my, you know, like I said, I would love to make this accessible for pianists of all levels. From absolute beginner, let's say somebody's just started to learn how to play the piano, I would love to make it a way that they can feel like they can participate. Up to, let's say somebody's you know, really advanced, they want to have a challenge, 
I'd love to do that too. Yeah, I think it would be a lot of fun too. Yeah, that's the goal. <laughs> so spread the word, get everybody excited about this. And if everyone wants to do it, I'll, I'll create the project, I'll create the format, and uh, we'll put that together. That would be so much fun, wouldn't it? Okay. So thank you. I want to thank everybody. I really, I had a great time with you guys. Thank you for your great questions. Thank you for participating. I love this live streaming format. This is, you know, it's, it's one thing. Have I posted the tutorial about how to create a virtual choir in real time? Yes, I did. Well, I posted part one. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but part one is up, okay? If you go to Cunningham Piano and just, you know, put in a search word for um, chorus or choir, and you'll see there's part one of the tutorial has been, oh, ask your students, yes. Yes, so part one has been posted. I've got a ton of footage for part two and maybe part three. I just haven't had time to put it together yet. So the, the first part of the tutorial basically shows the setup, okay? And um, how you can assemble all the footage, how you create the conductor video, and how we, uh, and the, the next part of the tutorial will be how I receive the videos and then some of the editing processes. You'll see it kind of behind the scenes of what software I use, how I align things up together, and it doesn't go into the full, the, the full advanced stuff. I don't think I recorded that, but you'll, you'll see, you see the premise of how it, it comes together. So yeah, so those two, oh, so you saw that already? Okay, so, so I apologize. The next part hasn't come out yet, but hopefully, hopefully soon. So as you can probably tell, I've got a big backlog of videos to make, but that's okay. But thank you for reminding me. I will try to work on that. So, I, um, so that's really the next part. And, and again, I want to, I'm, I'm creating more work for myself, but one of the things I'm thinking about, too, is the fact that um, the, I use professional software. I use Adobe Creative Cloud Suite, uh, so I'm using Adobe Premiere for the video editing, and I have some very specific reasons why I use that program. I also have Final Cut Pro, but I just found Adobe Create, uh, Premiere better for multi-track editing. And I use uh, Adobe Audition for the audio processing. So those are the two primary programs I'm using to create the, the, the blended video. Um, so uh, when the tutorial comes out, you'll see that process. Um, I, I probably, I don't, I, and it's just, the tutorial will show you a basic grid tutorial, just to show the, how I made the grid. Um, not the advanced grid, just the basic grid. So the, the, that part came, <laughs> it was the last minute. I spent 24 hours nonstop editing at one point uh, because we had this new visual idea, which can, was the final result. So anyway, but thank, Hunty Boy, thank you so much. I appreciate you asking about that. I will try to get that out as soon as possible. Um, yeah, so uh, just out of curiosity, if you guys don't mind before I close off the show for good, does anybody mind, just whoever's left here, I got 16 folks here, uh, just tell me where you guys are all from. Okay, just tell me uh, your country, your city. Uh, I'm just really curious to see what the reach of this is. If you guys don't mind letting me know wh where you're from. I'm here at Cunningham Piano in King of Prussia. King of Prussia is uh, on the outskirts of Philadelphia. Um, sadly, we're also one of the epicenters of uh, the coronavirus here in this region. Um, although, you know, every, everybody's being very, very careful. The store is closed. I'm all by myself. I'm being very, very safe. I do have a mask, so when I go out, Please don't worry, I'm, I'm, being, I'm taking care of, I'm being very, very safe and careful. Um, so somebody's from Massachusetts, hey, thank you so much, really appreciate it. Well, where else is everybody from? I know one of you is from Germany, I know. <laughs> this is somebody who actually studies with me on my online school. Lancaster, UK, how cool, Germany, Bavaria, ah, this is so, so neat. It's a wonderful, Hong Kong. Wow, how are things in Hong Kong? I hope things are a little bit better now, yeah? Things better for you over there? I know, uh, just, uh, I have friends. Oh, hey Gary, St. Louis, hey, welcome, welcome. Colorado and Germany, yes, oh, wonderful. Well, Calvin, please stay safe. I, hope, I, I hear things are getting better out there. I hope that's the, uh, that's the case. Please be, be, be very, um, it's true for everybody, no matter where you are. Please, please, please be careful out there. We want you to be safe, yeah? Um, Colorado, Germany, Hong Kong, Bavaria, Lancaster. This is so cool. Anybody else? Where else are you guys from? Where else are you guys from? So uh, King of Prussia, uh, we're, our store is actually right, located right across one of the largest shopping malls in the United States, which sadly is closed for now. We, all the major stores have been you know, mandatory closures to help um, flatten the curve. 
Um, so we're all doing our part as much as we can, which is kind of giving me an excuse to, to kind of live in this store. I kind of live here. I brought all my stuff with me. Oh, you're welcome, Calvin. Please, please, please be careful out there. I have some very, very good friends in Hong Kong. So uh, I'm so glad. I just want you guys to be safe out there. Australia, how cool. Thank you so much. And the Outback, wow. <laughs> We've got a real global reach here. This is so cool. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate you guys keeping me company and participating in this kind of ad hoc session. As you probably guys, you guys probably know, if you missed the beginning of it, I answered a whole bunch of questions uh, about teaching online and specifically uh, some other answer the questions about microphones, about setup. So you know, you, after the stream is done, you should be able to watch it again. You know, this, uh, that's the nice thing about YouTube Live. It automatically saves the live sessions as recorded videos, okay? So I'll probably do this again, because um, I, I, this is for me, um, I find this so much more fun to make a video to answer questions rather than just kind of type out my responses. So if you guys don't mind, I'll do this on as, as, as often as I can. Um, uh, and uh, if you have more questions, feel free to post them on, on our various channels. And uh, oh, oh, great, great, great. Uh, I'm so glad you found, so Jay Smith, I'm so glad that you found the videos helpful and that they've helped you set up your own online piano lessons. That's great. Chris, you're very, very welcome too. Again, I'm so glad that could be helpful. I've heard from many, many people. I'm just very glad that in this challenging time that I have something that I can share that folks can have found helpful and uh, hopefully to keep my colleagues, all of my musical colleagues around the world gainfully employed. But uh, more than that, more than just kind of, hopefully I, 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 my, my dream is to inspire everybody to, to really think of technology in a whole different way rather than just as a means of carrying on what you've done before, hopefully to transform your ideas of music education, particularly what it means for your students going into this into the future. Oh, Calvin, I'm so glad you enjoyed watching. Thank you so much. I love this. I love this feedback. This is so cool. You know, I, I make so many videos, uh, just videos. You know, I, 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 show, I talk about all the pianos that we have here. I talk about the different music technologies. But this is so cool. Oh, Baron, the real Baron, you're very, very welcome. I love this. I love this interaction. So I'm going to be doing, I think I've gotten the, the live stream bug. I'm officially addicted. This is so much. The real Baron, you too, please stay safe. Yes, I'm being very, very careful. I have masks and I, I've got enough food in my kitchen to last me for several weeks. So I'm, I'm well stocked. <laughs> I, you know, I love to cook and I'm just, uh, I'm being very, very careful. So I really appreciate it. And everybody else here, also, please stay safe. I really appreciate you guys hanging out with me, spending some time. I hope you learned something. Um, and again, if you guys ha have questions, if I've missed your questions, leave them in the comments. We've got lots of videos. Feel free to you know, leave some comments there. Visit our website at CunninghamPiano.com. And we've got, you, know, all, you can see a lot of my past videos there too. And if you want to see a little bit of my personal life, some of my pre-quarantine travel videos and foodie videos, visit my personal website at hughsung.com. Uh, I, I, I just, I love creating content. All right, Pat, thank you for that thumbs up there too. You, uh, and uh, from, my, from everybody around the world, thank you so much. Hello, no, Odin, I'm about, to, I'm about to close off. So last, last call, where are you guys all from? We've heard from We've heard, heard from uh, the UK, from Hong Kong, we've heard from Germany, we've heard from the Outback in Australia, Colorado, Massachusetts. Any, any other places that you guys are from? I would love just to get a quick geographical count for where, where you guys are coming in from. All right, I think, I think we're probably at the end of our participation. And uh, I want to thank everybody so much for spending time with me and for the kind of the free flow of the show. And we'll do more of these. Like I said, oh, the US, great. More US folks, great. No, Noden, great. Thank you so much. And like I said, if you enjoyed this, be sure to subscribe. And uh, right now, I haven't set up a regular schedule. I'm just kind of posting this whenever I feel like it. Um, if you guys enjoyed this live streaming show format, let me know. And I, I may try to make it more of a regular feature, particularly you know, while we're closed. <laughs> so, you know, uh, uh, this is a great way for me to, to answer a lot of questions, post the questions on our website at CunninghamPiano.com. You can visit me at QSung.com too if you'd like. Uh, uh, YouTube videos, of course, you can leave comments there. And I was just answering questions. Oh, Jane, you're very, very 
welcome. I'm so glad you found this helpful. And I'm, like I said, I, I spent the first portion of this live stream answering questions that were posted as comments on the videos. So keep them coming. I, I am reading them. I am collecting them. And I will probably have different topics that I'll answer questions from on future episodes. Ah, what keyboard is best for beginners? You know what, No Noden? That's a big topic. So why don't I save that? Do me a favor. Post that on one of the videos or go to our website, post that question or you know, find a comment. That's a great question. And that might be the topic, might be the topic for my next video. Because I do that's a that's a big question, okay? And there's a lot of things to take into consideration for that, okay? Great. You know, no, that's that's the, so um, a lot of it's going to depend on your age, okay, your living situation, um, and uh, you know what kind of music you want to learn. Um, there's there's so many different options. Uh, like I said, visit. So known Odin, here's what I recommend for you. So you want to figure out a keyboard, what keyboard is best for beginners? Visit CunninghamPiano.com, and I would say start exploring. Okay, because I've got videos on almost all the pianos that we carry. And just watch. Watch a couple of videos. See what you like, okay? Because there are so many ways to learn. In fact, uh, and like one example is I did a video on, um, there, sometimes you can learn with apps. I know a lot of people le learn from YouTube, right? Um, there's an app called Flowkey that I did a video on at the Cunningham Piano website. Check that out. Um, connected to a digital piano. Um, the disc clavier is a fantastic learning piano as well. So the answer is really it depends. And there are other instruments that do other things that, you know, how do you, how do you want to learn? Do you want to learn to make your own songs? Do you want to learn, you know, uh, with a rhythm track, with an orchestra behind you? So you can see th there's a whole world out there. You know, and so a lot of times I think for beginner keyboards, you know, it's a big open-ended question. Okay, so... Um, Rather than saying, get this keyboard, get that one, that's the best one to start with welding. Like I said, it's a big question. So my encouragement to you would be visit CunninghamPiano.com, explore our pianos. We've got lots, I've got videos on so many uh, different instruments. I've got videos on different technologies, different apps. The Yamaha CSP150 is a great, app, a great piano with streaming lights. So lots of different ways. I mean, traditional approaches, we've got silent pianos, disc clavier's. So, so that you can see, there's a, there's a, it's a big topic. Okay, and maybe what I'll do is I'll try to make a, a presentation of it, and maybe even uh, bring in one of my colleagues to join in, so he can pitch in as well. That would be cool. So if I'm not just doing the live show by myself, but maybe I can bring in somebody else uh, to join me on the live show. I think that would be kind of cool too. So anyway, thanks so much, everybody. I really appreciate you taking the time to visit and hang out with me. We'll do this again soon, and maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll actually schedule ahead of time so you guys can set your schedules and, and just be with me right from the get-go, okay? Thanks so much. All right, no Odin, you're welcome. Thank you so much for visiting, and I'm going to call it a day, and I'll see you guys. Be sure to subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time. All right, let's see if I can get this to go. Goodbye. Take care.